Hello, everyone. I'm Ed Denzel, and I host Unfound, and I run this YouTube channel. I realize you don't want to give a thumbs up to the following video until you watch it. You know what? That's totally understandable. I can appreciate that. But what you can do right now is subscribe to this channel. The button is right there. Thanks. Douglas Paul Crawford was a 66-year-old from Orange, Texas. He was a father and cancer survivor. On March 18th, 2021, in Venton, Louisiana, Douglas allegedly allowed two people he didn't know to borrow his car. When they returned, Douglas was gone. He was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. In the most recent newsletter and Patreon blog, I wrote about how the public has a huge misconception about violence in the United States. The fallacy is that people harming people they don't know is common. This is driven by the almost legendary status of serial killers and the U.S. media's obsession with inner city slash urban slash minority crime. Yet, these incidents make up the smaller slice of the crime pie, not the larger one. People hurting people they know is much more common. As proof of all the quote-unquote foul play as most likely disappearances unfound is covered, and there are many, there are only three where there is adequate evidence to believe people not known to the victims caused the disappearances. What are those three? Brandy Wells, Brandy Myers, and Pearl Pinson. That's by my calculations. Yours may be a bit different. Suffice to say, though, there aren't many. Well, with the disappearance of Douglas Crawford, we may be looking at another of this type, and the first one concerning a man. What exactly happened when along came some strangers? And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Linus' website, charlieproject.org. Douglas Crawford, being born in 1954, became a teenager at just the right time to become a hippie. And he carried that title with pride throughout his life. Doug loved all the old tunes and knew all the lyrics. It was always 1970 to him. However, Doug was still an adult, getting married and divorced, having several children, getting work, and most importantly of all, surviving cancer. Although he did lose his voice in the process. Outside the cancer, Douglas's biggest struggle was his on and off again relationship with methamphetamines, a habit he most likely took on again not long before his disappearance. So, on Friday, March 17th, 2021, although living in Texas, Doug was in Vinton, Louisiana, to see his family. He was also taking some time away from his common law wife due to her own addiction with meth. But Doug planned to drive back to Texas that night. However, on the evening of Saturday, March 18th, a stranger used Douglas's phone to call Doug's family, saying the phone had been found in the parking lot of a motel where Doug used to live in Vinton. Disappearances involving addicts and addiction are hard enough as they are. However, any disappearance of any type 
gets even more complicated when we must consider that the perpetrators are people who didn't even know the victims before the disappearance dates. Keep this in mind as you try to answer these three questions during the interview. Number one, did this disappearance happen on the 17th or the 18th? Number two, why would people harm someone on one hand, then do the responsible thing by calling his family on the other? And number three, why haven't pings of Doug's phone led to finding him? Doug's family believes that several people at the Vinton Motel know exactly what happened to Doug. The guest for this episode is Doug's daughter-in-law, Katrina Crawford. Unfound news. As was mentioned at the beginning of this episode, the newsletter went out this past Sunday. Did you get it? It was a unique one. I hope you enjoyed it and found it informative. And yes, I got up on my soapbox just a bit. Next, this coming Thursday, May 12th, at 7 p.m. Eastern on the Fischler College of Education and School of Criminal Justice YouTube channel, I'll be appearing on Dr. Telesco's show again to discuss the disappearance and murder of Zoe Campos. Yep, we're doing something different this time. Finally, Dad is here. He's doing his thing and I'm doing mine. Still, I may not be as efficient as usual with my unfound work. Please bear with me. Where you can find unfound. Spotify, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, Podbean, and many other platforms, especially outside the United States. Unfound has social media accounts on... Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on the Unfound Podcast channel for the live show, the only one of its kind in true crime. Ask questions, chat with other viewers, and give the show a thumbs up. You can contribute to Unfound in the following ways. Patreon.com forward slash Unfound Podcast. PayPal.me forward slash Unfound Podcast. Contribute during the live show with the Super Chat. And lastly, join the YouTube membership program for the low price of 10 cents a day. The website, theunfoundpodcast.com. The email address, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. And please mention Unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the daughter-in-law of Douglas Crawford, Katrina Crawford. Katrina, welcome to Unfound. Thank you. Let's start here. You are, uh, like I just said, you are not uh, Douglas's daughter. You're du uh, Douglas's daughter-in-law. You are married to uh, his son, so how many uh, kids does Douglas have? Let's talk just a little bit about the entire uh, Crawford family, as it were, and then we'll get into Doug specifically. Okay, he has uh, my husband, Jason, is his only son. Okay. And Jason, and, uh, Doug and Lynn, which is Jason's mother, mm -hmm. was married, and they had Jason, his sister Kim, and his sister Jenny. And then they split up, and he got with Trish, with his girlfriend, mm -hmm. and they had Jessica and Destiny. So wow. there's five together, one boy and four girls. All right, so we have uh, two other siblings that are full-blooded siblings to your brother, and then we have two half-siblings. Correct. Okay, and I'm guessing being that there's a couple marriages or relationships involved, maybe the ages are quite spread out? Yeah, Jason's 49, and... Uh, it, she's the youngest. She's 23. Wow. 26 yeah. years difference. Wow. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, how, I, maybe just in general, how does everybody, how has everybody gotten a, along over the years regarding all of this? 
uh, Jason and his two uh, full blooded sisters. Yeah. Have, they've pretty much been on board and Destiny. Uh, Jesse, we call her Jesse, not Jessica. Mm -hmm. She's uh, more angry about everything. Mm -hmm. You know, she's angrier one out of all of them. And, uh, she's sad too, but she's more angry about everything. Everybody else is pretty much kind of chill, you know, but Jesse's really mad about the whole everything. I guess what I'm asking is over the years, well before he went missing, how did the families oh, all get along? They was perfect. Perfect. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. yeah. They was all close. Uh, every one of them. Okay. All right. Well, that's good to hear. As you, as you would know, uh, you know, sometimes when these things happen, things can, people can be bitter and everything, but I'm glad to hear that uh, everybody moved on to other relationships, but everybody got along pretty well. Everybody's oh, yeah. gotten along pretty well. And, every, and most importantly, regarding Doug's disappearance, everybody is on the same team regarding all this. Oh, yeah, for sure. All right. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. Well, let's talk about uh, Doug. Uh, how would you say he is or was as a, of course, a father-in-law, as a father? How would you uh, explain him? We'll get into some of the particulars, but just in general, you uh, being married to his son for as long as you have, having him as your uh, father-in-law, you know, talk, tell the people about his personality, et cetera. Oh, he was, uh, he was amazing. If you ever back to when the hippies, the hippie days, like mm -hmm. peace, love, and happiness, the Beatles, that's Doug. Like, he is all about peace. He hates drama. He hates conflict. You know, he just, he's the type of person who wants everybody to get along, and he just loves everybody. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, he's just that type of person. And when so, I tell you, to tell you about music, honey, let me tell you, yeah. he would... He can literally tell you what the songs, the words, just everything, especially like the Beatles and uh, Eric Clapton. He loved them. Uh, he also like, uh, oh, what's that? Led Zeppelin, I think's the name of it. Yeah. Oh, right. he, he loved, he just loved music. Uh huh. Okay. And and John Lennon, yeah. John and his Lennon, age is from that generation. So that makes a lot of sense. Right. Yep. Exactly. Right. Right. So you and him. Uh, you and he got along pretty well then. You you oh. liked having him around. You know, some people, they're a little, you know, standoffish about their in-laws. That wasn't the way it was with you and Doug. Uh, we loved him. He was like my daddy. I ain't even going to lie. Like, he was my best friend. I loved that man with everything in me. So what was he into? We'll get into, you know, some health issues that he had and everything. But, um, you know, about uh, what was he into? What were his interests besides music and knowing all this? What else was he into? Just being around family. He loved to go visit people and sit and watch uh, YouTube music videos. Mm -hmm. all, like he could, him and Jason would do that for hours. Him and his brother would do that for hours. And he loved to drink Budweiser. Yeah. Okay. And that... He, that hit Budweiser and his music, and he was good to go. Okay. Um, how long, maybe I should ask you this. How long have you and your husband been married? So how long have you known, actually known Doug? Almost 10 years. Almost 10 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, personality, very outgoing, very hippie-ish into his music. I know a little bit about that. I'm really into my music, uh, too. Uh, over those years, of course, before he went missing, how often would you say that you and your husband saw Doug? I understand that at some point he moved from Louisiana to Texas, but how often would you see him? How long often would you get together with him? Oh, all the time. He was over here two, three times a week before he had moved to uh, Texas because of the hurricane. Yeah, he was mm -hmm. all the time. Okay, very good. And we're going to talk about that in a second. All right, let's move on, on to this. Uh, and and maybe I should ask you this. His uh, uh, his uh, woman, uh, his uh, was she his girlfriend or he, was she his wife, this woman, Trish? How long had they been together before uh, he went missing? Just roughly, would you say? Uh, I want to say about 30, 35 years. Wow, so quite a while. Yeah, yeah and they was just... Oh. They i don't know but they never got married they okay. always all right okay so all right so boyfriend girlfriend in 30 some years 
common law husband and wife is how they call it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so they've been together for a very long time, and yep. they were together at the time of his disappearance. And we'll get into where she was and where he was. Okay, very good. Let's move on to this now. Um, Doug, though, did have uh, cancer, and I I'm understanding though that he was a cancer survivor. Uh, did you meet him before or after? Did you know him before or after he got his cancer? I knew him after. After, okay. Yeah. Um, what is your understanding about uh, when was he diagnosed? Uh, we know that, was it throat cancer? Yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. As far as I know, he had uh, throat cancer like three years before I met Jason. They had uh, found it, but through, through, through the years, his voice would get like, like real fast and he could barely talk. And then they finally went to the doctor and that's when they found the cancer. And they, I guess they cut out, cut out and he had a hole right here in his throat, but he has been cancer free since then. Okay. And so, um, so maybe around, let's just say 2007, 2008 is when he was diagnosed. Would you say that's a pretty close link, maybe 15 years ago? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, how would you say he, uh, how would you say he dealt with that? You know, dealing with him, my understanding you told me is he would communicate with a pencil and pad. Uh, maybe you can explain that a little bit to the listeners. He hated the, uh, do I think they called it a Doppler gamble or something like that, yeah. but he hated it because he said it made him sound like a robot. He did. He said he never wanted to sound like a robot. So he would always, anything he would had to say, he would write it down or he would text you. Huh. But he was like, it's, he, his brother, David died of cancer. His brother, Bobby had cancer. So cancer runs real bad in their, their family. So like him surviving from it, like he, he wasn't, I don't, I wouldn't call it, he wasn't mad about it or anything like that. Like he was, a, he was happy he was alive and he beat it mm -hmm. pretty much. Right. And, and, and as far as you know, or your, your husband knows at the time of his disappearance, he had not been diagnosed with any cancer to your knowledge. This is the only cancer he ever had. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And okay. Very good. And so, um, how, how would you say, like you said, he was uh, happy maybe just to be alive, being that he had other family members who died of cancer, maybe didn't live as long as he did. Right. And uh, was he, um, you know, I'm guessing that would make it hard for work and everything. What was he doing, you know, for money? Um, um, he was, know, I, I would think that might be hard to hold a job if he can't talk. You have to write with pen yeah, and paper. He was drawing disability SSI. Okay. And he had been doing that since uh, since, since he had cancer? Yes. Since okay. Jason been together, as long as we've been together, he's been drawing it. And it may have been before then. I don't really know. But he's that's pretty much what he does. Okay. Do you know what kind of work he, uh, employment work that he had, you know, well before his cancer? Where, you know, what oh, yeah. did he do in his, like, 20s and 30s? What was he doing? What was he, he into? He was a uh, ball of maker pipe fitter. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. In the uh, asbestos, you know, I'm talking, uh, that's, no. that's what caused throat cancer. Okay. All right. Yeah. I was wondering about that. I was going to ask you throat cancer. I usually, I think most people usually think, well, if somebody gets throat cancer, maybe it has to do with smoking or okay. tobacco or something, but you're saying it was asbestos. Yep. He actually had a, uh, was in one of them lawsuits before he oh. had he was in the process of it. Like he was already getting checks and stuff from it for the asbestos lawsuit. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. You've already mentioned, now we'll move on to this. So he was a cancer survivor living his life. Just be happy to be alive. You know, he's, you know, with his family, he's with the same woman for 30 some years. He has five kids. Obviously, maybe he wishes he had his voice back, but it seems like he adapted pretty well. Everybody yeah. had a good attitude toward Doug. Sounds like a, a guy everybody wanted to know. However, oh, yeah. something other else bad happened in his life, and that was this hurricane. Why don't you tell the listeners about what happened there? He lost his house or where he was staying. Why don't you talk about that? What hurricane was it? What year? It was Hurricane Laura, and it was two years ago. 
um, it hit where he was a direct hit. It was a category four. Uh, he didn't, he was supposed to go with his daughters, but instead he come parked his car over here and he went with us to Monroe to evacuate. Uh, his girlfriend stayed, she didn't want to go. Whenever we got back, him, I, and Jason had went over there and like his house was totally destroyed. So we got up everything that he had and he come and stayed with us afterwards. Now, granted, my house got messed up, but not as bad. You could still stay in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so he stayed with us for a little while. Then he went to uh, Maryville. That's the name. Maryville or Doobie, I don't know what the name of it is, but where his uh, daughters live because they didn't get hit as bad as we did over here. Okay. And that's, I want to say, about two weeks after Hurricane Laura. Well, no, yeah, about two weeks after Hurricane Laura. Because okay. we didn't, we didn't get and, power and, for almost two months. You didn't have power for almost two months? Correct. Oh, my. Oh my. Wow. Now, maybe we should clarify this. Where was he living and this house got, uh, where he was living, got destroyed? In what town was this? Venton, Louisiana. There's, right. a, and, there's a little motel type thing in this jig. And right on the side of it is a, a two bedroom house. Mm -hmm. And he lives in a little two bedroom house on the side of it. Okay. And uh, this is the, the motel that we're eventually going to be talking about that is connected to his disappearance, right? Right. right. Okay. How long had he been living there? Um, as far as you know, about a year. All right. So not long, not long at all. Not long. He and Trish were living there in Vinton, Louisiana. Correct. Okay. And she stayed behind, I guess. Uh, of course we know that she survived, but, um, I, I, I guess, uh, did she get out of the hurricane without any injuries or anything? Well, how did she survive if that house got destroyed? Like you said, it did. I don't know how she got, I don't know how she survived. She was high. I ain't gonna lie. She was high. Oh, uh, okay. All right. How she, she <laughs> called us okay. uh, three something in the morning. She was freaking out and you could hear the winds just howling when she was on the phone with us. And we mm. just told her to hunt down and put a mattress over and pray. That's all we can do. Right. I mean, what are you going to do, right? You know, you, everybody is uh, stuck in the same place. Nobody can get anywhere. Yeah, we was five hours away. So, but we did call the Vinton Police Department after uh, settled down to go check on her, and they got her out and got her her daughters. You know, I can't being that I live in Clearwater Beach, Florida, so just across the Gulf from all exactly. of this, you know, in kind of a diagonal direction, I guess. I kind of remember Hurricane Laura, and was this one of those things where you knew it was going to hit for many days, or was it like kind of a sudden thing? Do you even remember that? No, we knew it was going to hit. We just, we didn't know it was going to be a Category 4. Yeah. They were talking Category 1, 2, but it just kept building and building and building, yeah. and yeah, it was a very, strong, it was kind of like Hurricane Rita. Okay. And her, right. I don't know if you remember Hurricane Katrina. Excuse me? That Hurricane Katrina that hit New Orleans. It was just, that's how strong it was over here. Wow, okay. All right, so he comes back. The place he's staying is pretty trashed. So he and his uh, girlfriend, Trish, where do they go to live? They went to their daughter's house, Jessica and Destiny. Uh, Jessica's husband, Charlie, has... Uh, some land in Maryville, and Texas, and they had like little uh, shed type things that they had turned into a house, and there was four of them, and Doug and Trish had went and stayed in one. All right, so they moved entirely to a different state. Right. Okay, but we have to remember, you kind of live close to Texas anyway, right? This is very close. Which, it's like 30 minutes away from where. All right, so it's another state, but not far. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more maybe about Trish. You said they were together for 30 some years. Um, I, you know, I, you say you got along well with Doug. Would you say that you and your husband got along well with her? We've already talked about, uh, she was doing drugs during the hurricane. We're going to get into the addiction side of this in a moment, but how would you say, uh, Trish was as a girlfriend to Doug? Was she good for him? What would you say? I don't think it was good for each other. Mm -hmm. Um, Personally, 
I didn't want Doug with her because of their active addiction with each other. Uh, but now, I, don't get me wrong. She loved Doug with everything in her. Uh, she would kill for yeah. that man. Loved him, but it just, they wasn't good for each other. You know, they was toxic when they was together. Not okay. fighting or anything like that, just because of their addiction. Okay. But she was a good person. She still is a good person, okay. you know? Do, once again, I understand that you've known Doug for about 10 years. You've been married to his son for that time. So, that, you know, they've been together for 30 some years. This, and you know, we might as well move into that. This addiction that popped up in their relationship, was this something, your understanding, by the way, your understanding, was this something that started way back 30 years ago? Was this something more recent? Or how do you, did any, either of them try to go to rehab? What do you understand about that part of their relationship? Um, as far as I know, like, because back in the hippie days is when it started. Uh, and it, it, they had gotten clean for a long time. They didn't go to rehab, but they did get clean for a long time because they had separated. And so as long as they was apart, they was good. They was clean. It's whenever they got back together that they, and it wasn't right off the bat. You know, they was clean for a long time, years and years. Wow. Just, I, I don't know what happened to make them go back and do it again, but they did, unfortunately. And okay. was this was this something that you and your husband were aware of that they had, uh, what did it say, fallen off the wagon? Or uh, yeah. was this something like you knew them maybe when they were sober and then you saw them kind of fall back into their old ways? Yeah, yeah. My husband, right off the bat, and we tried to get Doug away from her just for the, the better of both of them. Not only my husband and I, but also Jessica and Destiny. You know, we we tried to get them away from each other because we knew, you know, them together wasn't good. Even though they loved each other dearly, you know, just that addiction. Man. But unfortunately, they were still in it. Okay. And as far as they, Trish is sober. Okay. Uh, and what was their addiction to? Meth. Okay. In Zan and Xanax. Okay, we're going to talk about the Xanax here uh, in, in a, a little bit. Why do you think that uh, all occurred? Of course, we know that Doug, uh, when he went missing, is 66 years old. I'm going to take for granted Trish is, uh, you know, uh, maybe I'm older. I'm 51, so I'm probably older than I am as well. Um, you know, we don't usually talk about a lot about older people having addictions such as this. You know, do you have any insight into that at all? Usually, at least on, on found, we start talking about addictions for disappearances. Young people, 20, 30 years old. Of course, we have Doug and his girlfriend, much older. Any insight into that at all? Uh, the older generation down here are starting to get in that phase of life. Why? I don't know. But there is a lot and I see it for myself around here that, you know, 60 and 70 year olds are getting high on meth. Okay. All right. All right. I, I, you, you're a witness to it. You can talk about it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I just um, have some uh, questions for you just about the current state of Doug not long before we met, went missing. How would you say he was doing in early 2021? Of course, living through COVID, maybe most of that's gone away now here in 2022, but how was he handling that? All the different changes that everybody was going through. Uh, how was he doing in early 2021, in your opinion? He was doing, the both of they were doing good because he was terrified of COVID. Uh, he would wear his mask around. Of course, he had to wear a little neck guard for his throat. Uh, he didn't get out. He had, he was terrified of COVID. Wow. So he ate endured. He, uh, you know, he went by the rules and regulations. We would text back and forth, you know, cause of course we didn't get out either cause I have three kids. So, mm -hmm. but I mean, they were doing good then. It's when everything started, you Oh, know, I guess coming back to light where you could go to the store, you could go visit people or whatever. That's I, I'm assuming. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's party back on the stuff. Right. So Louisiana, maybe a little bit late here, like Florida, where we kind of went a little looser on some of the rules in contrast to maybe a state like California 
or New yeah. York, which were a lot more stringent and locking people down a lot harder. Here in Florida, as I've told people, um, you know, it's been kind of normals really since like the summer of 2020, really, you know, Here, you know, so, um, you know, you, you know, even though it's not, it's not been like that. So that's what you're saying. Louisiana, not as locked down as much. So when things started to loosen up, maybe Doug and Trish kind of went back into some of their old bad habits. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now we do have to talk about something though that you had just told me in our previous conversation and it has to do with the Xanax. Of course, um, let's, uh, maybe I should start here. He was living in Texas, but of course his disappearance happened in Louisiana. What was he doing in Louisiana? Do you know how long he planned to stay? What was he doing there? What was your understanding? My understanding was that um, he was coming here to get away from his girlfriend because um, his daughter, Jessica's husband, was planning on kicking her out because she couldn't stop getting high. And Doug just had to get away from it all. You know, he had just had enough. So he had come down here to visit his brother, Bobby, and Jason and I. And he wasn't planning on staying. Uh, he was coming down here, to do what he had, you know, just visit, get away from over there for a couple of days, and he was going straight back home. All right. So your understanding is it's not like he was moving to Louisiana to stay forever. He was maybe right. just taking a four-day, five-day trip. Yeah. All right. And he has his own car, so he drives by himself. Like we said, it's not far. He comes over to see all of you and then maybe kind of let things cool down and then go back to Texas and try to figure everything out. Right. Okay. Um, who was he staying with uh, in Louisiana? Where was he staying? Uh, who, did he stay with you like, for a night or what was he doing? Where was he sleeping? I guess he stayed with his brother, Bobby. To tell you the God's honest truth to this day, I don't know where he stayed Thursday night. He got down here Thursday he, and he, uh, he was at Bobby's, his brother's. So I'm assuming that's where he stayed the night out Thursday night. He had come over here Thursday but he had just got his uh, Xanax, so he was messed up. He didn't remember. So he come back over here that Friday, and he was clear as a bell. I'm assuming he had stayed at his brother's house. I don't know. Bobby, um, Bobby and Doug was very close. So just to talk about it or anything, like it just, Bobby can't handle it. Because he's old too, you know. And it's very, very hard for him right now. Okay, so, all right, so he comes in on Thursday, so, and then you see him the next day, but like you said, you saw him on Thursday, and we talk about addiction, he had this Xanax addiction, addiction. when you saw him on Thursday, did you know he was high, could you tell? Yeah, yeah. All right, and so then what you're saying is, when you saw him the next day on Friday, he didn't even remember seeing you the day before. No, he didn't, and that's what Xanax oh. was, you could tell, like, is when he write. His writing was all sloppy and everything else. You couldn't understand what he was writing. You couldn't understand what he would text. So that's when you knew that he would, uh, he had taken the same next. Okay. Uh, do you know, I mean, we're not here. I, maybe we would like to get maybe some doctors in trouble or somebody for doing this. But do you know where he was getting that Xanax from? I'm guessing he was getting it on the street or illegally to this day. Of course, we know that his disappearance is kind of new. It's just over a year old. Um, do you know where he was getting that stuff from? No, I, I don't know. No idea. All I right. think the doctor was prescribing him his, but he was more than what he's supposed to. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so he was doing this. Do you think he was doing this before he got there on Thursday driving, like driving while high on Xanax or how do you, how do you look into that? No, he would have got him Thursday. Okay. All right. he, uh, at the pharmacy in Benton, because that's where he lived, you know, before he had just mm -hmm. had anything over to Texas yet. So all of his doctor's visits, because uh, he was taking other stuff besides Xanax, you know, he had to have heart medicine, he had to have thyroid medicine, just a, a bunch of stuff he had to take. So, and all of that was at uh, the pharmacy in Benton. So he wow. would come through, you know, we knew he would come through there to get it. But so he, he had just gotten it that Thursday because he had just got the car Wednesday night from his daughter. All right. 
Okay, so he has his car, he goes over there, he, he gets this, and it it sounds like he was being over-prescribed Xanax. I mean, if he can't remember you the next day, then something weird's going on. Uh, I've never taken that. But the, the, he just took to, he took more than what he was supposed to. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, thank you for being uh, honest on that. Okay, so he comes over here. You see him on Friday. And in fact, we're not going to get into this. We're not here to tarnish anybody's reputation. But you did tell me in a prior conversation that one time – he was driving one way, you're driving the other, and he almost wrecked into you due to him probably driving while intoxicated or high. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's all right. all right. So we understand this is what we're talking about. This is what was going on with him. To your knowledge, uh, in the conversations you had with him, whether on Thursday or Friday or any, anybody else passed this along to you at the time, did he talk about going to the Vinton Motel at all this place where he had previously lived uh talk about going there at all no he told us he told his brother and he told his daughter jessica and destiny that he was going home okay so when was the last time you and your husband saw him friday and he friday morning he came over here uh my husband and my husband's cousin doug's nephew was going to build me uh he come to do me for a carport and Doug had pulled up, not remembering that he come the day before to show us, you know, his car. Huh. And uh, he had pulled up, you know, they visited and this, that, and the other. We showed, because that's whenever we was starting to redo the house from Hurricane Laura damage. And so, you know, they was showing him, Jason was showing him the house and whatnot. And he asked Doug, you know, you need anything? And Doug pointed at the, uh, we had some bags of insulation that was left over. And Doug had pointed at them and he wrote down, I need them for my house. So Jason gave him two big black trash bags of insulation for his little camp over there, thing over there, put them in his car. They talked, he left here about 12, 31 o'clock saying he was going home. And when you, when you thought home, you thought he meant Texas. Correct. He never mentioned anything about going to the Vinton Motel at all. No, he no, said no. he would go and try to talk Charlie out of uh, making Trish leave. Okay, so that meant going back to Texas. All right. right. Um, maybe at this point we, and I'll probably post a picture or two, uh, or maybe maybe do a map video just to show some of these locations. But uh, the Vinton Motel, maybe even though he had been living there, he'd lived there for a couple of years. Of course, we know that it got really damaged during this hurricane. Just give the listeners maybe your general uh, description of the motel and kind of the environment there. Uh, it's like a crack motel, like a drug motel. Um, mm. Unfortunately, uh, there's a bunch of older people there that are probably on disability. Social Security can't afford much rent. So it's just like a little, uh, they call them shacks. A little, uh, it's a one bedroom, one bath, no living room shack type thing and um they pay monthly to live there unfortunately it's it's not a good place at all uh, i personally i would have want my worst enemy to live there it's just mm -hmm. it's that bad all right and you had the you and your husband had these concerns about uh him living there even before the hurricane it was like oh, that even before the hurricane it, i'm 43 years old and when I was in like the first or second grade, my mother, we had, we had lived in Benton and my mom said when I was in first or second grade, it was like that way back then. Wow. So, yeah. It's been like that for a time. Okay. All right. It has a reputation. All right. So you think that you and your husband and I guess other people in your family think that he's going back to Texas and you just talk to him whenever but what is the next thing that kind of pops up in his disappearance? Is it you you or your husband getting this call from this guy who I think's last name is Kano? Is that the first, the next thing regarding all of this regarding his disappearance? Well, the way you remember it? Not really. Uh, Friday night around 8, 9 o'clock, his sister, Jessica, had called Jason and said, hey, have you heard from dad? Oh. And said yeah uh he was over here yesterday and today and he said going home he said you know he's probably just blowing off steam you know just leave him be he'll he'll get in contact with somebody and all day saturday i had went to my niece's uh gender reveal 
when I got back, which was around noon, one o'clock, Jessica had called him back and said, you know, we still haven't heard anything from dad. So undoubtedly he was texting everybody up until about eight or nine o'clock Friday night. And oh. then they stopped. And Jessica was like really concerned. So we all started texting because you could still call his phone. He'd answer, but he got, you know, like make yeah. that noise to let us know. Yeah, I hear you text me. Okay. But uh, we'd all call, text, like a bunch of us was. And, and until Saturday night at 9.40 p.m. when Jose Cano Sr. called my husband's phone off of Doug's phone. Right. And said he found his phone and keys, but couldn't find Doug. Okay. Let me ask you a little bit about that then. When this is all going on and people are trying to reach Doug, once again, we have to remember he can't talk. So, you know, you know, um, uh, you can't hear him like, except for what you just described there. So texting was his main form of communication, at least with a, a phone. Um, and of course, we, I, I have to admit covering 250 disappearances now, sometimes we get a little suspicious when people only want to text, they don't want to talk. Um, but in this situation, I guess that's the only thing Doug could do. Did anybody call like Trish or his family, uh, that family, the other rest of the family and text to say, Hey, did he get back there? Did he arrive there? Did anybody do that? Like Friday night into Saturday, to your knowledge, uh, his daughter, Jessica and his daughter, destiny. Okay. They, they called and not, they, it was discovered that if Doug was headed back to Texas, he did not get to Texas either on Friday night or on Saturday, even to the afternoon. Right. Okay. All right. So you're all wondering where he went. Maybe it's possible he had a wreck. Maybe he had some sort of health issue, a lot of different possibilities at that point. But then all of a sudden out of nowhere, uh, this guy, uh, once again, if you could say his name, I would appreciate it. Kano. Jose, Jose Cano, uh, senior. There's, there's two. There's senior and junior, and uh, maybe we'll just call them Cano senior and Cano junior. He calls who? You did he use Doug's phone or whose phone did he use? He used Doug's phone to call Jason at nine forty p.m. Saturday night. Huh? And what did he tell your husband? And were you there for this call? Did you see? Did you hear like I, this husband's uh, side of I the conversation? My husband was sleeping. I heard his phone ring. I was using the bathroom and my bathroom was right next to our bed. And the uh, phone rang and I heard Jason say, hello, hello. And he hung up and thought he, he called it back and I was walking out the bathroom. I'm like, who was that? He said, dad. So Jason called the number back and Kano Sr. answered and he said, I found your dad's phone and keys on the hood of his car. And Jason said, who is this? And he said, Jose. And he said, who at and where's my dad? Jason was mad at this point because someone had his dad's phone. Mm -hmm. And he told him, he said, I'm at the Vinton Motel. And Jason said, well, you could imagine what he said. I'm not going to say mm -hmm. that on here. But uh, right. yeah, very upset. He said, look, you stay right there. And we live like, I want to say 15 minutes from the motel. So Jason told him, he said, you stay right there. I'll be right there. So Jason jumped in his truck and hauled butt over there. Uh, when he got there, the two bags of insulation that Jason had given him the previous day was yeah. on top of Doug's car. And he seen a little Mexican standing by Doug's car, which turned out to be Kano Sr. Mm -hmm. And that's how, that's how that went down. All right. So, uh, once again, it'll be a, as we don't do, a, we don't do hardly any theorizing on the program, but, um, so are we to understand then that, uh, Doug's car is at the Vinton motel and Jose Cano senior goes in there, just happens upon the car. And what he is telling, what he told your husband, the way you understand it is that he sees the car. What's this car doing here? He pull, he parks next to it or something and sees Doug's phone on the car in the insulations out of it as well that's, that's what he what, said that's, that's what he said okay um until that point had you or your husband ever heard of uh jose cano senior did he live at the vinton motel what you know what did you know about him at that point 
We didn't know nothing about him, never heard of him. He did not live at the Benton Motel. Uh, we didn't know, and Doug didn't know him either. Any person that Doug knew, because he had just gotten that phone, excuse me, he had just gotten that phone and I was putting uh, the contacts and stuff in for him Thursday. I was putting all his contacts with the right numbers and the name, this, that, and the other. And if Doug talked to you even once a month, your name and number would have been in that phone. Okay. Kano's number was not in that phone. Okay. All right. So if we're to believe him, and uh, like I said, I guess we'll go long enough in this interview to think that maybe this isn't the total truth, but he's saying that he just came up on the phone. He was trying to do the right thing. Maybe he starts going through the texts and just goes to the first text. It just happens to be your husband. He calls that number. Hey, I found this phone. And really, that's what you'd want somebody to do. If you lost your phone or something, that's what you'd want somebody to do. I you guess. Would. We found it if that Jason's name wasn't the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth call and wasn't the first, second, or fourth text. Okay, we'll get into, all right, very good. We'll get into that. Thank you for pointing out. Thank you for some foreshadowing here. Okay, so you go over there and uh, that night, of course, now we're talking Saturday night. It's dark. It's in this very uh, risky place, shady place. Uh, did you go along with your uh, husband or did he go by himself? He went by himself. I stayed right. home. Okay. So he's going over there, you know, some strangers calling in. I'm guessing you're nervous too. You I'm know, he's, he, yeah, my you're scared. Oh, and my brother-in-law, Jessica, uh, Charlie met Jason over there. Okay. So he's not going there. Luckily he had some other family members. He's not over there in case this is some setup or being lured right. somewhere or something. Okay. Very good. So they get over there and the car's sitting there and they run into Jose Cano senior, anybody else that they talked to that night. And, and we, you know, it's, it's hard to do this, but at the time, what do you think that your husband and what were you thinking about all this? Well, first of all, when he goes over there, is Jose Cano senior, the only person there that he talks to, does he talk to anybody else? He, uh, he was the only person outside, but started banging on doors, trying to find Doug. Um, they did talk to a lady named Frida. Uh, she said she hadn't seen or heard from Doug. They talked to a lady named Deborah Butts that night who said she uh, seen Doug and she had just seen him that evening and he was fine, but she didn't know where he had went. And mm -hmm. on the other side, there's like some more uh, little rooms over here. They had an older gentleman outside and they also asked him, you know, when's the last time you had seen Doug? And he said earlier in the evening and he pointed at the back cabin which is a lady named tammy rockeye cabin mm -hmm. little apartment so that was the last place he has seen him he hadn't seen him since okay uh your understanding is did, did jose cano senior live there at the vinton motel too or did he live somewhere else no he lived somewhere else him and frida was supposed to bar and girlfriend all right so I that's why jose was there frida lives there jose shows up sees the car etc Yes. Okay. And the way the car was situated, was it like in a parking place or did it look like it had been, you know, an abandoned, you know, how would you, how would you explain it? What is your understanding? It was parked in front of Frida's door. It was. Like, like someone, Doug or someone had mm -hmm. pulled the car up to her door, got out and went in and visited. Okay. But the thing is, Doug, uh, or Jose or anybody else is not uh, is not saying that's what happened. He's just saying he came in there and the car was like maybe in her parking place or something. And that's why right. I got interested in it. Okay. Now, I do have to ask you, though, at what point did this story come up about how Doug allegedly allowed somebody else to borrow his vehicle? When did that story come out? That night or, or later? Um, that story come out the Tuesday after he went missing okay, and from Tammy Rocka because my, uh, my husband and my brother-in-law had went back 
Sunday evening after we had filed the police missing persons report and they got Jose Cano Sr., Frida and uh, Deb all together and asked him, you know, like Timmy's telling us that you drove her, his car. And finally Frida came out with the truth saying, yes, he let me drive his car, supposedly to go find a camper spot in Starks, Louisiana. All right, so Freed is saying that somehow Doug showed up at the Vinton Motel. We all, and to remind the listeners and viewers, Doug never said anything to anybody about going to the Vinton Motel, but that's where his car showed up. But then he, he seemingly, that's where his car was. He, you know, the car is there. And then finally, not on that Saturday night, but a few year, days later, Frida finally says, you know what? He was here. He let me borrow his car. And I went and did something. And when I came back, he was gone. Correct. That's that's her story. To your knowledge, and we'll get into this a little bit later, did Doug at that point, even though he had been living there, did Doug know anybody in that Vinton Motel at all? From he knew his a, prior prior living there. Prior living there. Knew a couple of free people. Uh to my knowledge, Trish is the one that knew Frida, Doug's girlfriend. But as far as I know, the person he knew on a personal level like that, you know, would be Deborah Butts. Okay. And so maybe, uh, once again, this would be from him previously living there before yes. this hurricane. Okay. Yes. So everybody else maybe is new or you just didn't know them or whatever, but this Deborah woman is somebody that, um, he knew and, but she, uh, was she any help regarding that night seeing Doug? You already stated she said something, but did she see him maybe on Friday night or Saturday afternoon? What did she say about seeing him? She said she seen him Friday, Friday uh, night, Saturday morning. And she seen him uh, Saturday evening right before dark. Okay. All right. Just and, walk, uh, the motel. Okay. So once again, we have this but, story that, uh, that Jose Cano Sr. told originally about pulling up and then a few days later changes and we'll come back to that. Regarding the police, uh, I'm guessing your husband got them involved in those first few days. What did they do? Like you said, did they talk to these people? You know, maybe just overall give the listeners and viewers uh, an idea for what the police did, uh, who they talked to. Okay, we called the police Sunday morning because uh, again, his seat in his vehicle was pushed so far up, a very, very short person had to be driving. Okay. And was not short. He was about, I wanna say five, 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 six. So he was, it was too, the seat was too far pushed up for him to be driving. So I called my husband and I called my sister-in-laws and I said, look, y'all need to get down here. We need to call the cops. We called Benton PD. And at first Benton Police Department did not wanna take the missing persons case. They said, because he lived in Texas, we would have had to file it there. And so my husband kind of got a little upset and he's like, no, we're not going to Texas. We're going to file it here. So the, the cop calls his uh, boss and his boss says, yeah, go ahead and file it. We filed the missing persons report. We told them like everything from point A to point B, who called Jason. And as soon as we told him who called my husband, Jason's, the look on the face was like, oh, this is bad. This is bad, bad. Uh, we told him, we, you know, we wanted the vehicle fingerprinted because we told him about the insulation bags and whatnot. They didn't do nothing. They made us vehicle from the vent motel and bring it home. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, it wasn't until two weeks after he went missing before they went questioning anybody at the motel. Okay. About All right. Except for maybe Frida who, who came out later and just kind of divulged uh, maybe a, an alteration to the original story. Uh, at the time... They, they didn't question Frida at all. Oh, okay. All right. So how do we find out about how the story changed a couple days later about how she said... That, that was um, the, my husband and my sister-in-law. Jason yeah. and my brother-in-law was there that Sunday night because they was going, you know, try to see if they could find him. And she told him that Tammy was the one driving the vehicle. And then when my sister-in-law, because I did a search party, and me and my sister-in-law 
she went there and I went, you know, just looking kind of on the sides of the roads and stuff. And that's when Frida came out and told her that Tuesday was, no, Tammy wasn't driving it. I drove the vehicle. Doug let me drive it to Starbs. Okay. You, all right, we'll come back to that. Search is done. Uh, where, at least initially, where were some searches done? Uh, or maybe I'll, I'll add this in there. Uh, did the police get any permission from any of the people who lived at this Vinton Motel to go into their places, kind of look around? Was anything like that done? Uh, as far as I know, no, but they might have. But as far as I know, the police didn't. Mm -hmm. Myself and about 30 other people met up at Market Basket in Vinton. Uh, half of us went from the Vinton Motel uh, east two and a half miles down the road <laughs> on each side of the road, ditches, you know, whatever. And we went two and a half miles that way. And then we went all through going west. Wow. And some other roads, uh, like creepy roads, just that and the other that different people had told us, look, he might be here. He might be here if he was hurt or something like that. So we went and looked all through them roads. We did go to the Vinton Motel and searched it. We didn't get to go in the rooms, but we yeah. did get to go around it and search it thoroughly. Okay, so we have his car there. We're going to talk about the phone again here in a moment. We have that insulation. Uh, but what else is missing besides Doug being missing? Is his ID missing? Is his wallet missing? What else, Here's What the way you understand the things that he usually had on him, what was also was missing? His he, Him, his wallet, he had a, a bandana that would go over his ears like it covered this part and it would go down to a t like that mm -hmm. he had yeah. that miss his mask that he would wear it was uh one of them blue and white masks that you would get at a hospital okay that was left his vehicle and he didn't go he didn't walk around because he was still scared of covid even though he had his first shot he was still scared of it so he ran talk to people without his mask on his mask. Okay. and still to this day we haven't found his wallet okay all right thank you all right so uh but his car is there's phones there and we're going to get back to those here in a minute but uh regarding though the vinton motel as a whole your understanding is the only person that he really still knew there was this deborah woman frida jose anybody else the police or you your family could have talked to there those are all people that to your knowledge, did not know Doug at all. Correct. Yes. Okay. Very good. All right. So you do these searches. Of course, his disappearance is unfortunately still unsolved. We're doing this uh, interview on April twenty first, twenty twenty two. So just over a year since it uh, it happened. Um, so you did these searches at the time. You did the best you could. It seems the police. Uh, would it be fair to say that the police probably <laughs> know the reputation of the Vinton Motel? So maybe. They didn't uh, work on this as hard as they should. Would that be yes. true? Yes. Yeah. All right. Because it has a reputation of being shady and and all of these things. Very common. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's move on uh, to some of these things. And of course, uh, these name these people's names are going to come up again. Um. So Doug uh, is in. Texas. He wants to get away from his girlfriend for a little bit. Maybe some things going on there. But that Friday night, your understanding is he was heading back to Vinton or heading back to Texas. But we, of course, know that he didn't. He never mentioned to anybody about going uh, to the Vinton Motel. And in fact, maybe he didn't go there. Maybe he was somewhere else and he ran into somebody and somebody drove his car over there. Or not to theorize, but we just have to keep that in mind. But we know that very quickly, my perception is people realize something uh, was, uh, you know, wasn't right. People trying to text him. He's not getting back to them. Okay. Um, regarding, let's go back to Doug's car. Uh, he had just gotten that car. Just gotten yeah. it. All right. He, his daughter had given it to him. Wednesday night. Wednesday night. All right. In your opinion, the way you know Doug, did he not have a, a car? What happened to any other car that he had? Did he not have one before that, or, or what happened? He did have one, but the uh, I think the motor got too hot, and the the uh, fan wouldn't cool the motor off, so it it no longer worked. Okay. So he had in a couple of months, 
And then she gave him that one. And he was coming down here to show Jason, Bobby, you know, and the rest of us. Okay. All right. That's nice. Um, in your opinion, given this story that we now know about what Frida eventually said that she was driving it, in your opinion and in your husband's opinion, would he have ever let some stranger drive his vehicle? Nope. Because the vehicle wasn't in his, it was still in his daughter's name. So even if he was messed up, high, drunk, whatever the case may have been, mm -hmm. he, he wouldn't, still wouldn't have let anybody drive it. He never let Trish drive his vehicle. They was together for 30-something years. And right, he so, never drove the vehicles. All right. So even in previous cars that he had, he wouldn't let other people drive them. I'm a little, nope. maybe a little bit the same way. I can relate to that. But um, there's no way he would just pull into the Vinton Motel for being what there for whatever reason and just say, oh, okay, Frida, I don't even know you. You can drive my car. Exactly. Okay. Um, you talked about uh, the seat being uh, pushed up. Doug, not a tall man, though. You said that it's very short, but he's he, Doug was only 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, or yeah. kind of a short guy. The, the seat, like, you had about this much room from the steering wheel to the seat. Like, well, when I tell you it was pushed all the way up, a very, 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 very short person had to be driving that vehicle. Okay. Is there any chance, just as an example, that somebody might have moved the seat the whole way up to reach in? It was this a two-door? What kind of, maybe you should say this, what kind of car was it? It was a Ford, uh, uh, uh shit. <laughs> Ford, no, what was it? Well, it's just, it was a Ford, it, it was a car? It was an SUV, oh, okay. and it had four doors and a hatchback. Okay, all right, so maybe a Ford Escape or Ford Explorer? <laughs> Hey, I couldn't think Ford of the escape. Uh, Ford Escape. I got it on the first yeah. try. That's nice. Okay, very good. All right. So, is there any chance, as an example, that somebody could have moved that seat up the whole way because they had to reach behind it for some reason? Of course, it's a Ford, or you'd think they'd just open the back door. You would just, in my opinion, you would just open the back door. Okay. So, that doesn't then make a lot of sense that somebody would move this whole seat up to reach back. So, do you think um, anybody. Uh, Anybody could have sat in that front seat. How tall or short would you have had to have been, in your opinion, to sit in that front seat? I would say like five foot two, five foot. And mind you, and Jose Cano Sr. are very, very short people. Oh, they are. Okay. All right. So we have this uh, seat that's pushed up. What about these? I think this is maybe an important part of this. What about the this? The, the notebook or papers that he used to communicate with people, were those in the car? No. At that point in time, he didn't uh, have the money to go buy a notebook. And when I went to go purchase him one Thursday to give it to him that Friday, they didn't have any at the dollar store. So, and nobody knew this, but him, I, and Jason, not even his daughters knew. I went, I got him a little, uh, it was like a little marker board with an eraser, erasable marker on it. I'd got him that and given it to him Friday because nobody had any notebooks around here for sale. Okay. And so that had, and it that was not in the car. Um, what was found in the car was a, pa a cellophane pack off of cigarettes and two burn holes in the driver's seat. Uh, his daughter didn't smoke. Neither one of his daughters smoked, mm -hmm. uh, and Doug couldn't smoke if he wanted to. Right. So, uh, all right, so this this little white board that you got him, that's missing too. Well, so they found it, I want to say in the back of the motel. The police supposedly found it in the back of the motel, uh, like two weeks after he went missing. What does that mean, the back of the motel? What does that mean? There's like, uh, the motel's like this, this, and it was found behind it. In All the, right. Uh, so, okay. So what you're saying is it was found outside behind like the office of the motel. Right. Yeah. Okay. Huh. All right. I don't know what to make of that. All right. So that was eventually found, but it was, was that found, would you say by accident? 
or uh from what i heard i don't know for sure because this is just hearsay but deborah said she seen the uh the the notepad and she seen dc on the top of it so she called police right away and they come and took it okay was there anything written on it i did put his name his dc the initials at the top of it but no there was nothing you could tell that it was wiped off that there was writing but you couldn't tell what it was what it said okay, okay. wow what did he normally do with it when he was using just regular notebook did he save these notebook conversations that he had or would you just throw the paper out what would he, he would if he'd had a notebook what do you think would have he would have done he would it would have been thrown out he always tore every time he'd write something to tell somebody something he would uh tear it out and throw it away okay all right so we got this whiteboard i think that's a good choice uh might even be a little more uh environmentally friendly or something with all not as much paper being used but right. in a situation like this it, it would be somebody for easy for somebody if he was having a conversation and something went wrong that somebody could just go and write that in contrast if it was a notebook then that might be a little harder to get rid of okay we also have this these ashes and everything in the car so the car kind of gives the perception that somebody else was driving it yes okay let's go all right that's um and so is then the story that she was telling that she uh when eventually this came out is that she took the car for a drive and when she came back doug was gone yes that's the story she's telling okay all right let's move on to this regarding and I, we'll get to the the the, the paradox there that uh, before we're all done here but doug's phone uh of course jose cano senior is saying he found it on the the hood of the car i think that that story has to be in doubt now given what frida was saying but did you look at it did your um did your husband get to actually look at it and see, you know, who had been texted, who had been called? Did you actually, did he actually get to do that? I did. That Sunday morning, I got up and I told my husband, because his phone was dead at this point, I said, I'm going to plug his phone up and I'm going to go through the last people that he had texted and maybe call him and see if maybe he went over there or whatever. Mm -hmm. And as I was looking through it, I found two, two things that was very, very weird to me very off okay. one was frida texted his phone at 9 08 p.m saturday night and said hey hun you okay and then again at 9 09 p.m and said this is frida and mm -hmm. then because my husband whenever he had got there that saturday night he told jose he said i'm gonna call you and he said uh no he said you call me so i can have your number so I can, you can call me if uh, my dad shows up and I can come bring him his keys and stuff. Yeah. So I remembered the number. So, and when I looked at his phone, I'm like, well, that looks like his number. So I went and grabbed my husband's phone. And sure enough, at 9.33 p.m. Saturday night, Jose Cano Sr. used Jose's phone to call Doug's phone. And then at 9.40 p.m. Saturday night, he used Doug's phone to call Jason. Huh. Okay. So the question then is, if Frida and Doug didn't, didn't know each other, how did she know his phone number to text him? Exactly. No, do, her, we, do we, do we her, know the answer to that question? Do you know the answer to that question? No. no. Okay. He has, she says, oh, that wasn't me that, uh, texting, but whenever I was standing in front of her, I called the number and it was ringing in her pocket. Okay okay and she was like dumbfounded all right so she was denying that she did it but then when you called you know all right so we have this this whole thing uh is very very shady you know first they're saying that he shows up and you know it's the car is there and the phone's on the car and they're claiming they don't even know who doug is but then eventually she claims yeah i drove his car but if she was driving his car then how did his phone end up on the hood of the car? Was she driving the car around with the phone on the hood? Right. Uh, I mean, okay. I would assume that it would fall off, but that's you would think you would think. Okay. Um, regarding the phone, maybe we'd even go back a little, uh, further. 
after Doug left your place on Friday, did he, of course, with texting, you never know if it's him or somebody else anyway, but w could you find any messages that he sent on Friday into Saturday that you believe were sent by Doug? Did you get a chance to look at that on the phone? I did. What, did. what did you see? He, Friday, he had texted Jason to tell him, ask him if he was home, that he was coming over. I knew for sure that was him. Uh, he had texted Jessica to ask how Trish was doing, because again, she was over there messed up, and uh, he was just kind of checking in on her. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, there was three other texts that was just numbers. And uh, it was just a bunch of gibber jabberish, you know, what mm -hmm. nothing pertaining to Doug or something Doug would send, you know. And who did was, these messages go to? I don't know. I don't know. The, the cops took the phone after that before. I didn't even think to write them numbers down mm -hmm. because okay. at that point in time, you know, we thought that maybe he was just out in the woods or something somewhere, you know, just off of somebody. Right. We didn't think he was actually dead. All right. So, so I, in your in your opinion, as much as you and your husband or other people you trust – got to look at the phone, the best you can do is assess that sometime on Friday evening is really the last time you can guarantee that a message sent from the phone was from Doug. Yes. That's about the best you can do. But we know now, though, that his car and everything weren't, you know, discovered or whatever happened until like a day later. So this, his last message is on Friday. Right. The, and the car and all this stuff with Frida and Jose don't happen until 24 hours later on Saturday night. Right. Okay. okay, very good. Now, here's the other confusing part regarding all of this, regarding Jose and Frida, is that uh, there is, of course, ping information. We know about these texts, and we know that uh, – and we'll come back to Jose and this phone in a second. But what do you know about ping information regarding – uh, Doug's phone. What do you know about that? Uh, I know for a fact that his phone pinged off camera communication tower at around 9.18 p.m. Saturday night. Around 9.20 p.m. Saturday night, it pinged by uh, Rock High Road. At 9.23 p.m. Saturday night, around in there, it pinged by WPA Road. And at 9.30 p.m., it pinged by the Venton Motel. All right. So for all of us who have not been to this area of Louisiana, this ping, the first ping that you described, where is that? What town is that in? Where is that? South of Louisiana, which right, is so about 10, 15 miles from Benton. All right. So that evening, that night of Saturday, once again, you know, and how did you get this information, if you can say? How did you get detective, that information? Uh, detective Lyons, that was the first uh, lead detective on the missing persons case. Okay, so he was nice enough to tell you that. Yep. Okay, very good. That's very unusual. I, I, I thank him for telling you that. That's very helpful. All right, so this phone of his uh is over there in sulfur which is like you said 10 to 15 miles away vinton the vinton motel is in vinton which is very close to the texas louisiana line sulfur louisiana is even further east further away from vinton further away from the texas line and the way it looks to you is that the phone's pinging in sulfur and then with each ping it gets closer and closer to vinton to the point where it's back at vinton that's the way he described it to you this detective Right. Okay. Yep. Is he was he able to tell you how long that phone had been outside of the Vinton area, or did he just tell you about the pings coming back? Did he tell you about the pings going to Sulphur? No. He just told me about them three, them four pings. That's all he would tell me. Okay. All right. So this would then fly in the face of the story that Jose originally said about flying finding the phone on the hood of the car because the phone was in sulfur, right? Exactly. All right, so that, that that information, which is scientific, it cannot be disputed, uh, flies in the face of the original story that Jose told your husband and told you. Of course, you heard about it too, and anybody else Jose might have told the story to. 
And really, I guess it could fly in the face of the story that Frida told as well, that she said that, you know, Doug let her drive his car. Well, did he really let her drive the car and his phone was in the car? That, right. That, but she went to Starks in the car because she caught on red light camera in Starks mm -hmm. in his car in the driver's seat. All right. And um, well, that's interesting. Let's talk a little bit more about that. What kind of camera was this that caught her? That's very interesting. How was that even discovered? Uh, from what I gather, it was a red light camera that wow. caught. Her. And the only reason why I found out about it is because I went in uh, the Benton Police Department to ask, you know, just an update on the case or whatnot. And when I walked into David Lyons' office, I seen the picture of his car and Frida driving it. And I'm like, what is that? And he hurry up and covered it up. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. What is that? And that's oh when he gosh. But there was a person in the, in the passenger seat, and I couldn't tell who it was. I knew it wasn't Doug because Doug had hair kind of like yours, but mm -hmm. about to his shoulders. Yeah. So I knew it wasn't Doug because this person had short hair. And I was like, well, who's the driver? Who's in the passenger seat? He said, well, you know it as well as I know it. So I'm thinking it was Jose Cano Sr. in the driver's seat. In the All passenger. right. Is it your then understanding then that the reason this picture was taken is because she went through a red light illegally? That's your, that's your best understanding? That's my best understanding. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's very, and so where is, um, and like I said, it feels to me like I'm going to have to probably do a map video of this to help some people along here. So we have Vinton, which is, um, very close to Texas. We have Sulphur, which is east of Vinton. Where is Starks compared to those two locations? Starks is right on the Texas, Louisiana line. When you cross into Louisiana, mm -hmm. you're in Starks. It's called Toomey Starks. Okay. That's the first exit you would take if you're on the interstate so it's right there on the texas louisiana line wow all so right so that's like it's kind of like in the opposite direction of sulfur if you're in vinton so if you're in vinton you have to go west to get to starks right. and if you want to go to sulfur for vinton you've got to go east right okay and remind me and the, the viewers and listeners again when, to your knowledge, when was this picture taken of Frida driving Doug's car? Do you even, do you have any idea? Right when it was right getting uh, dark. Right Saturday before. evening. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So she's driving his car. I mean, she, I guess she told the truth on that, I guess. But, oh, yeah. Um, she told the truth. She wasn't going to get a camper spot. She finally told the cops that she was going out there to get drugs is what she was going to get. Okay. Uh, to your knowledge, any phone pings that put Doug's phone in the Starks area? We only know about the Sulphur area. Any pings that put his phone in the Starks area? If they have some, he didn't tell me about it. He just told me about the Sulphur pings. Okay. And once again, we have to establish, to your knowledge, to anybody who... Of course, it's been a year since he went missing. Nobody has come forward to this day to tell you, you know what? Doug knew Jose and Frida pretty well. Correct. Nobody, Nobody. at all. Nobody Not even all. girlfriend. All right. And we have to remember that Jose and Frida's numbers were not in his phone. Correct. And you had just looked at his phone like the day before, a couple days before, helping him out with you know some of the numbers and everything, and they were not in there. They was not in there. Okay, very good. Thank you. Now let's move on to this. And um, this is a, a little morbid just uh, before we get into this. You had told me about some hair being found in Doug's car. Why don't you tell the listeners about this? How did this come about? Were you the first one that saw it? Did your husband first see it? How was this even discovered? Hey. Um, I had hired a private, not hired, she's like a part of a group called Missing Hearts, that when we went and searched, a volunteer firefighter had given me her number. So I had contacted her and she started helping me get professional searchers with cadaver dogs and stuff out in Benton to search for Doug. Okay. About a month after he went missing, um, some, some people with cadaver dogs come out met me at the Benton, uh, at uh, Market Basket in Benton and went over Doug's vehicle with the cadaver dogs. 
the cadaver dogs hit on Doug's vehicle and the back they had back hatchbacks. So I called David Lyons, which was the lead detective at the time on his case. <coughs> and look, the cadaver dogs just hit his vehicle. His body was in his vehicle at one point in time. And at that point in time, David Lyons is like, oh, I'm seizing the vehicle. I need the vehicle right away. Brought the vehicle to the Vinton Police Department. It stayed there for almost two months. And supposedly, Alcashu Paris went over it with a fine tooth comb. Didn't find anything. So he called me to go get it. I went and got it and brought it back here. Uh, and the private investigator said, look, take everything out, take a picture, put everything back in, take another picture and send them to me. So I was doing that and I was just putting the last pieces in the hatchback that was in there. And I went to close the hatchback and I don't know, for some reason I looked up and where the uh, hydraulic thing meets the hatchback on the body of the car. Yeah. Be that on the body of the car, I seen a clump of Doug's hair behind it. And I called my husband over. He was home and he's he's just like put his head down because you know we knew what Doug's mm -hmm. hair looked like. So we knew it was Doug's hair. And Did you I take a picture over. of this? Yes, I do have a picture. All right, I, I would like that picture. Would sir, I'd, I, at the time the listeners should know that at the time of this uh, interview, I've not seen that picture yet, but I certainly would like to see it uh, for myself. And um, and you're sure, of course, that it is Doug's hair. There's no mistaking it. No mistake. No mistake at all. When there, there was for him on that car for two days, there was so much of his hair, just strands of his hair in the back of that car. It, it was beyond crazy. I couldn't believe how much hair he, of his hair was back there. It shouldn't have been back there. And then I called my sister-in-law because my, it was my sister-in-law's vehicle, you know, so I called her. I was like, I'll come down here and get the vehicle. I got it back from the police department. And I said, I, I found his hair. I said, well, I'm not going to tell you where. I said, just come down here and I'll show you. And when they got here, she said, you know, Saturday, whenever we went and picked the vehicle up, it was hard to shut that hatchback. And I was like, really? I said, which, which side? And at this point, I didn't tell her where I found it, which side I found the hair at. Mm -hmm. And she, it was the driver's side. Her husband had to kind of like jolt it to make it shut. And it was the same side I found the hair on. So any idea how the police allegedly went over that car and missed that? Any ideas? Have you brought that up? What did they have to say about all this? They said they have not the slightest idea how they missed it. I say, y'all some professionals, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. All right, it's and crazy. so was that hair eventually taken out and put in the, like yes. an evidence bag or something? Yes, they took it out, uh, took pictures before they touched it, put the uh, the numbers on it and took pictures and took it into evidence. And still to this day, we still don't know for sure if it's Doug's mm. hair. Okay. Um, how much hair? Well, how much hair would you say? I I don't even know how we'd break this down, but get, do your best to describe how much hair would you say was there. It was a good clump of hair, about that much. It was behind. It was all attached to a leaf, and if you if you zoom into it, on one part of it, you can kind of tell uh, part of his skin is also. Huh. Yeah. So would you say uh, we have to remember this is a, we're doing video, but we're doing audio. There are people who only have the uh, audio. Would you say that this uh, clump of hair was like? I don't it was know, two inches by two inches, or one inch by one inch, or okay, it was about this much hair right here. All right, so she, what she is uh, showing me in the video for all the just audio people is probably a couple inches of hair, in my opinion, two inches, maybe thirty yeah. strands of hair that are about two inches long. Okay, wow. Well, if it's skin attached to it, then they should be able to do DNA on it. We have to remember when it comes to hair, they need the root of the hair to be able to do an A. If you just like clip the hair off like at the ends, then that's not gonna give you DNA. You need to get like the hair that's actually still in the scalp. So I'm hopeful on that. What okay. I think he shut his head in it. That's well, how we're, not gonna, we're not gonna get into that. We're just gonna talk about the facts. We're just gonna say that his hair was in the back of the hatch and it's probably in a place that it shouldn't be. Okay. 
Um, now, you've done some searches. In the first place, maybe um, there is, a, you know, we don't want to, there's so many rumors uh, that I really don't want to get into because I think it clouds the entire thing. I think we're just talking about the facts. We're t talking about how people's stories have changed. But there was one place that got mentioned uh, that caught my attention. And it's a, actually a place called Burned Out Bridge. How did this place, uh, the name of it, even pop up? Had you ever heard of this place before? Um, you know, explain all of that to the listeners and viewers, if you could. Uh, Burnout Bridge is a place where there used to be a bridge there, but it burned down. Hence the word Burnout Bridge Road. Mm -hmm. So it it's a, it goes to the end, and the, now it's a boat launch. You can launch your boat there, but you can actually look at the water and see that there where the pilings was for the bridge. Well, a lady. I forgot her name, but anyway, she had missed private message. She owns some rent houses in Benton and she happened to be cleaning one of them one day. And uh, Mr. Jose Cano senior and a couple of other guys was outside the window of one of her rent houses. And she had had the windows open because I, I assume the people staying there was nasty. So she was airing out the house and she overheard him say that they strangled him and threw him in the water at burnout bridge road so and then but if you there mm -hmm. when you're going on the road if you're going down burnout bridge road, before you get to the end of it on each side there's a big pond on the left and there's a big pond on the right yeah and we we searched burnout bridge road um we didn't go all we didn't we went around the pond where we could get to but we didn't go all the way around the pond. Mm -hmm. And Burnout Bridge Road through all the stories and just everything, Burnout Bridge Road has been the number one place that everybody is saying mm -hmm. or overheard or whatever is where his body is at. Okay. Uh, Burned Out Bridge, is it near Sulphur? Is it near Vinton? Is it near Starks? You live there. What would you say? Starks. All right. So once again, then, we have this video, this picture of Frida driving Doug's car, presumably with Jose. It does To you, it does not look like Doug was in the car with her in the passenger seat. And so we have this pinging at Starks. We have this picture at Starks. We don't have a ping, but we have this picture at Starks. But Burned Out Bridge is kind of near Starks as well in right. that direction. Okay. All right. And you, like you said, you searched that area. Of course, nothing has been found yet. Where are, where are some other searches that you've done over the year? You've already talked about what you did at the time right after Doug's disappearance. What else have you done over the past year? Um, we've had eight different people come out and search. We uh the name Wimberley property come up um we had searches go out there nothing was found um there's this road called number seven road that goes uh from Benton to Starks but it's like just a shell road dirt road all the way down and it's I want to say it's about five miles long okay and uh I personally walked it looking for Doug we had other people on four wheelers and whatnot, but uh, yeah, we searched that. We searched where WPA Road is, the pings. We searched them two roads, WPA Road, Rock Island Road. Uh, we searched all of Benton Motel. We've searched, there's a um, mm -hmm. an old rice dryer right in front of uh, Market Basket and nobody uses it no more and it looks creepy as hell. We searched that. We pretty much searched Myself, others, and the searchers have pretty much searched all of it wow. and some of Starks. Okay. Now we have, to remember, of, though, uh, we have to remember, though, that Doug's phone, uh, if we're to believe this detective pinged in sulfur, um, if we are to believe that something would happen, maybe of... Uh, you know, maybe on purpose, by accident, something happened to Doug, you know, and Jose and Frida and whoever else maybe did something to cover it up. We're not saying it was necessarily a murder, but uh, do um, any 
uh, locations in the sulfur sulfur area really jump out at you over the last year? Do you know if Frida and Jose have connections to anybody in sulfur that area? Do they know anybody there? What do you, what have you found out about that? Jose has a daughter that lives in sulfur. Like, the, from my understanding, from a ping, it can go from five to seven miles northeast or west. So I drove it myself from Camera Communications Tower to Highway 90, which Highway 90 from Sulphur going to Venn is where the pings happened. Yeah. And around in that area, the first ping is around where Jose Sr.'s daughter lives. Huh. As far as I know, Frida has a son, but he lives in uh, Orange, Texas, or Beaumont, Texas. Mm -hmm. I don't think she's affiliated with anyone in Sulphur, but then again, I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know Junior, Jose Cano Jr. is affiliated with a lot of people of where the first thing was at off camera and communications on Highway 90. Okay. So, but okay. I've never searched right there. I, that's one place I haven't searched yet. Okay. Um, have you looked into the background, for example, of Jose Cano Sr.? Does he have a criminal record? What, 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 if you've looked into that or anybody's told you that, what have you discovered? Um, he has a lengthy criminal record for aggravated assault, uh, assault with a deadly weapon, uh, mm. numerous, numerous drug charges, uh, numerous, uh, domestic violence charges. Uh, and same with uh, Junior. Okay. Uh, it's, it's pretty much the same with both father and son. And I do know that they did have another son, Ricky Kano, mm -hmm. and killed himself a month before Doug went missing. Wow. Yeah. And he was oh. also the suspect. In, there was a body found off of Ged Road. Uh, they call it Benton, but it's more so Benton Carlos type uh thing uh there was a body found of a young lady uh the killer was from Bo he lives in Benton, but he's from he was they was all in beaumont they hid her body off of Ged road and mm. supposedly i mean they say that he was in on the hiding of the body which is why he killed himself mm. his id or something was supposedly found at the uh where the body was so okay. i don't know who that is but Okay. Um, but you say Jose Cano Sr. did not live at the Vinton Motel. Where was he, Where is he from? Where does he live? He lives off of West Street in Vinton. Okay. All of those are from Chicago, Illinois. They oh, okay. live in down here for about 25 years. Okay. Okay. But overall, we still don't know the reason that Doug would have ended up at the Vinton Motel in the first place, right? We still don't. I mean, it. I, I, I'll, I'll admit that it does seem to me that, you know, what are the odds that he was out somewhere else and he would just run into trouble and his car would happen to, you know, show back up at the place where he used to live. Instead, I think what makes most sense is he did go over to the Vinton Motel for some reason. Something happened. But the problem is the way you've explained it is really uh, the people you know who live there now or lived there last year, there was only one person there who he knew, right? Yep. And that was that Deborah woman. And she has not said, well, yeah, I knew Doug was coming over to see me. She's not said that. No, no she has not said that. Okay. What is the, uh, somebody owns that property as shady as it ever is. What is the owner of this? Once again, no rumors, but you've talked to this person. Has this person been helpful at all? He, he, not really. He won't allow cadaver dogs on his property. He won't allow my searchers on his property at all. Um, about a week, well, not even, it wasn't even a full week after Doug went missing. They kept telling me the last place that Doug was at was in Tammy's apartment, the Tammy Rock High lady. Mm -hmm. So I finally got the Tammy Rock High lady's number, which is return who's told me that Frida was the actual one driving his vehicle. But 
I called her. I'm like, look, cause she, the night that Doug went missing, she left that place and never went back. Huh? Yeah. So I finally got in touch with her. I'm like, look, I need to see if his body is in your house. So I was on the phone with her on speakerphone and Mr. Red Leach is the owner of the property. And she said, look, you can go open my door to see if his body's in the uh, house. And that's about the only help that he's given us. Why did she say she left that place? She won't tell us. She Has changed. She, okay. She ever admitted seeing Doug that Friday or Saturday? She did. She did admit, admit he, she did even tell us that he was at her house. I don't care. Uh, sorry. <laughs> she did admit that he, he did go to her house. She said he was messed up really bad, hmm. like high, whenever he went to his house. But Ms. Deborah said that when she seen him, he was sober. All right. So we have two conflicting stories there. Yeah. The way you under, once again, the way you understand Doug and his addiction, it would not be possible for him to go uh, totally sober to totally out of it, like in 10 minutes or something, or, you know. It would take him at least three days to be totally out of it the way Tammy was talking. Okay. All right. Uh, like I said, we're not going to get into any rumors or anything, but these stories hurt, don't they? It's not, a, you know, it's just enough that Doug is missing. Maybe there was foul play. Maybe he overdosed some people, covered it up, or maybe he really did walk off and they just took his car for a joyride. I don't know. But the, the rumors and everything hurt, don't they? Oh, God, yeah. I've heard so many gruesome stuff that mm -hmm. I wouldn't wish on nobody. No. You know, because just because he was an addict, he was still a human being, you know? Yeah. He was still our family and we just, we want him home, whether it be to bury him or to have him alive. We just want him home. And it seems like nobody wants to give us that. Yeah, Katrina, you know, you're probably not aware of this, but I'll just tell you and the listeners know, but, you know, because we've covered disappearances like this before where we have a, a seemingly good person, you know, caught up in an addiction and, uh, maybe this person is not really a lawbreaker or anything, but people around him or, or he, you know, him or her are. Yeah. And, um, you know, that that affects, you know, you get so many rumors, you get so many stories that most of the time never end up being true when these kinds of disappearances are solved. You have a lot of people telling conflicting stories. It's just not that there's a lot of stories. A lot of them can conflict. And then you have law enforcement that just maybe doesn't want to put the full effort into it because they might look up somebody's, you know, criminal record and say, oh, well, this person was this, this person was that, you know, we just don't have the time for this. And then in this situation, the Vinton Motel has a, has a reputation going back 25 years yeah. You know, the, you know, I, it's easy for me to talk, but it's, you know, you shouldn't take these things necessarily personally because this is the way it happens in most of the time in disappearances such as this one, you know, yeah. this is, uh, unfortunately it's a, you know, it's a human tendency. I'm trying to change it, but, uh, certainly, uh, what you're experiencing, a lot of other people have experienced and it has nothing necessarily to do with Doug or you, or your family, or Louisiana, or Vinton, or anything else. This is just the way it goes in these types of disappearances. And, it, you know, you hear these rumors. I'm sure probably you're hearing new rumors pop up all the time. Oh, yeah, every day. Every day. Yeah. Yeah, it's horrible. How, uh, of course, I'm interviewing you, but how how is your husband doing? How are uh, Doug's uh, other children doing? Uh my husband isn't doing good at all he uh he is totally he's not himself anymore uh him and his daddy was very 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 close they was like best friends you know mm -hmm. like and he he's he's not the same person that he was mm -hmm. over a year ago um his youngest daughter doug's youngest daughter destiny is taking it very hard also all of them are taking it hard yeah but Jason and Destiny are taking it the hardest. And I don't, 
they haven't even really like Jason hasn't cried at all. Mm. And his mom, Jason, Kim, and uh, Jennifer's mom died unexpectedly a month before Doug went missing from mm. cancer. And then that happened to Doug. Wow. So, you know, it, it it's a lot on Jason's plate right now. What about Trish? Where is she in all this? Did she come over from Texas to help out? Uh, what did she do when Doug went missing? And I, we should say, I don't think she's a suspect in any of this at all. She's in Texas. But yeah, I, what has she been doing for the past year? I, I don't know. She hasn't helped us at all. She wow. has not called us at once. She did come to the vigil. But as far as that, she hasn't spoken a word to us. Because she knows that we blame her for it because you know he left because he didn't want to be around it no more yeah and um right but as far as i know she's clean and i mean i'm i'm, I'm glad i really am yeah. yeah but for you could have done this a long time ago you know and maybe he'd still be here but his, uh, but the daughter, the children, they have together. He and Trish have together. They've, like you said, they've taken it very hard, and they've tried to help out what they can. Oh yeah, oh yeah. They okay. they've been churches and just ev everybody. Even okay. like two other sisters. One lives in Chicago, Illinois. The other one lives north of Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. And anytime I need their help, any of them, you know, the drop of a hat, they come. Because Jason works all the time he's a supervisor in the plants so he works all the time he hardly ever has off um so he don't have time at all to help me yeah. and uh but yeah i mean every one of them has been awesome okay. they really excellent do you have a facebook page or website anything else uh anything set up for doug's disappearance if so uh, why don't you tell the listeners and viewers about it right now Yes, it's called Looking for Doug Crawford. It's on Facebook. He does have a NamUs code. It, I don't know it right offhand, but it is on Facebook on the poster. Okay. Uh, and it's it's myself and the Missing Hearts people, the foundation mm -hmm. that is helping me with it also. Um, okay. And, I mean, we have flower, flyers out everywhere. So I'm looking into getting a billboard put right there uh in Benton. So why don't you give the Facebook page name out one more time? Looking for Doug Crawford. Okay. And I do once again I do have to remind the listeners is that this is uh the newest disappearance that we've you know that we've covered on Unfound. You know, we usually we have a rule, maybe you don't realize this, but a disappearance has to be a year old before we will cover it for the uh episodes. And of course Doug's is just over a year old and the accepted, accepted uh, disappearance date is March 19th, 2021, March, March, March 20th, 2021. And that was that Saturday, March 20th, 2021 is the Saturday. Okay. Right. That's the Saturday we've been talking about. Okay. Uh, Katrina, any final words before we complete this interview? Um, just that if anybody knows anything that watches your episode, I wish you would reach out to the Venton Police Department or Calcasieu Parish Sheriff's Department and tell them what you know. We just want him brought home. Exactly. Good. Well, Katrina, uh, thank you for being on this episode of Unfound. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. You're welcome. And that was my April 21st. 2022 interview with Katrina Crawford, daughter-in-law of Douglas Crawford. I thank her for appearing in both video and audio for this episode. As I stated during the interview, I produced a map analysis for Douglas's disappearance, given that so many different locations were mentioned. You can find it on Unfound's YouTube channel. You've heard me or read what I've had to say about the concept of trying to apply logic to seemingly illogical situations when looking at disappearances and trying to understand them. Much of it is trying to fill in holes that can sometimes be rather large. 
For example, how can we explain why Craig Freer, a good kid, lied to his parents about his job that he had quit weeks before disappearing? How can we explain Kevin Newins not being at the bar after calling for a ride? How can we explain why anyone would wait for Jody Husentrut outside her apartment when she was late by over an hour that morning? Yes, we can create theories in all of those circumstances and others, but oftentimes no theory quite explains everything. It's like trying to put a queen-size sheet on a king-size bed. You can never quite cover that fourth corner. For disappearances like Doug's, when we have people with criminal records and addicts and drug dealing at shady locations, applying logic gets even more difficult. Then, as we have with Doug's case, we have at least two people who never had contact with Doug before the date of his disappearance. And we know that because of Doug's own phone records. We are then put in a situation where we're trying to fit a twin-size sheet on a king-size bed, where maybe two corners get covered. The confusing part, specifically for Doug's, is if, once again, if, Kano Sr. and Frida know what happened to Doug, even if they didn't have something to do with it, why use Doug's phone at all? Why not throw the phone in the car, wipe down the exterior and interior, lock the car up, throw the keys in the woods, and let the car sit there until somebody else gets interested in it? That would be the seemingly logical thing to do. Just have no connection to the car at all. And dare anyone to prove otherwise. Instead, they did what they did and brought themselves into the disappearance. Would they even have been mentioned at all in the investigation otherwise? Hard to say. Whatever you think happened, you should get involved in this very new disappearance then maybe some of you will be strangers who came along to solve this. I'll leave the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. Right now, while you are in your podcast platform, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, wherever, give Unfound a five-star review, a thumbs up, whatever that platform allows. I thank you for listening. I'm at Denzel. And you've just finished this episode of Unfound.